The noose was tightening around Braulio Castillo. All signs were pointing to him as a suspect in his wife's murder. That was first thought to be a mysterious suicide. And police just scored video proof that an intruder entered the home before Michelle and her kids came home and ran away some four hours later. Is Braulio the man on the video? Investigators can't be sure yet. They need more. The detectives ran cadaver dogs through that house. And cadaver dogs basically alert to the scent of human decomposition. This was 17 days after the murder. Michelle's body was gone by then, long gone. The house had been cleaned by um, Mr. Castillo's family. The sheets had been changed. The bedding was gone. And the dog immediately ran down to the basement and alerted in the shower where Michelle was hanging. They pulled the dog off that. The dog then went through the entire house, over 10,000 square feet. The dog alerted in one other place in the house, and that was at the foot of Michelle's bed. So this is not the uh, walking dead. Uh, nobody's walking from two crime scenes. So you definitely believe that she was likely dead upstairs in her bedroom? There's no doubt in my mind. DNA tests finally come back, erasing any doubts for investigators. It's their man. Braulio Castillo. And we had gotten the defendant's blood on Michelle Castillo's sweatshirt in multiple locations, as well as on one of the sheets in her bed. The blood evidence, that's like, it was, once I came back from the lab and I read that, it was Miller time. It was like, oh, thankfully. McCaffrey finds Castillo relaxing in a local coffee shop. We went up, approached him, and uh, he said, oh, hi, Mark, kind of surprised. I said, hi, can you stand up? and we stood up, I said, you're under arrest. It was a nice moment. <laughs> but on the eve of the trial, McCaffrey is hit with news that could jeopardize the entire case. He's fired by the county sheriff. He claims it's because he voted for his boss's opponent in the recent election. You lost your job. Yes, yes. As the lead detective in as this the, case. Yeah. I was concerned that these defense attorneys would somehow convince this jury that there was a problem with the lead detective. That's why he wasn't resworn. And so, you know, if you can't trust the lead detective, how can you Who trust can you the trust? evidence? Yeah, right. You lose your job, but you still show up in that courtroom every day, and you mm -hmm. still give this case 110 percent. Oh, absolutely. How could you not? Adding to the drama, another key witness has an even more difficult time showing up in court. How hard was it for you to make that decision to testify against your father? It was very hard from the, from the standpoint of that this is my dad. I don't want this to be my dad. It looks like my dad. This could be my dad. I think it's my dad. It is my dad. I had to go through that process, right, to slowly but surely make my way to the end where I said it was. And you knew it was him entering and then leaving? Yes. On both times? On both times, yeah. Without a doubt in your mind? You think he was inside that house? I know he was inside that house. Those children, she bathed them, she fed them, she put them in the bed, read them a story, they said prayers and said good night. That was about between 9, 9.30. All the time, Mr. Castillo was in that house, probably in the basement waiting, and then he ambushed her later on. This was a very quick but very savage attack. We feel that he disabled her very quickly um, and got her unconscious very quickly. Jurors also hear the heart-wrenching closed-circuit testimony from Castillo's nine-year-old son, who testified he had left his security blanket in his mother's room on the night of her death. And Mr. Castillo, I think, realized that this kid's gonna come popping out and come back into this room looking for this security blanket. And so what the little boy said was that his father appeared and brought him his little lovey blanket. He said he didn't say anything to him, but he gave him the blanket. And I asked him, how did you know it was your dad? And he said, because I saw his face. It was awful for everyone. That nine-year-old's testimony had a profound effect on Sherry Mullenberg, one of the jurors. It was the fact that he said his dad brought him his blanket. That was really important for all of us. I know he was telling the truth when he said that. It was very difficult for the jury to hear that testimony, but they wanted to testify. They wanted to be there for their mother. Raleo's nine-year-old son offers one last damning piece of information. 
how his dad got in the house that night. He said, I know you did it, Dad, and I know you did this, and you made me give you the passcode, and you, and, and you yelled at me. It was, it was just a, a horrific time, a horrific moment. By the end of the first day of deliberations, the jury reaches its verdict. Guilty of first degree murder. What was the reaction from people? Her, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, her friends and family were um, really grateful, really thankful. And you know, obviously Braulio and, and his family were really upset. Castillo is sentenced to life without parole, plus 16 years. He's appealing his conviction, claiming the evidence is insufficient for a guilty verdict. Castillo's hearing on that appeal is scheduled for May. What a selfish, horrific, pernicious, insidious, horrifying thing to have done to these children. Leaving behind a family torn apart by the murder of its loving mother, trying to heal. Today, the four youngest remain together in a new home. These children are actually thriving, if you can imagine it. But the eldest son, Nick, still struggles to make sense out of such a senseless loss. It's really, really hard on the mind. It hurts me every day, every time I think about it. Thinking about it right now, it gets me all choked up.